Wait. Okay, wait, it just did it. Okay, guys, um, I hope that someone is actually seeing this. We were um, ha trying to use the scheduled uh, live and guess what? It would not uh, start. <laughs> so I have no idea if anyone is seeing this one. If you are, could you please put a comment um, in it in the uh, in the post? Well, it's, I hope to God that it's going to notify everybody. Um, in any event, uh, yeah, that was interesting. Okay. Good. So I have no idea. We are very new to this. By the way, guys, this is Wraith. Um, you are hearing me. Many of you recognize my voice because you've actually heard the Dragon's Rain podcast or some of my other um, videos. And so I am interested in hearing from you guys. I just wish... Um, it was very weird. It kept, okay, well, I don't know. Very, very odd. <laughs> so I'm hoping that um, people are able to see this one. I'm going to have Kat go on to the page and try to notify people. So we're going to put um, a copy of the, uh, the actual video stream here. Let's see if it will do it. Um, that is my sincere hope. Um, if not... We will find out. Um, let's see here. People are doing something. This was not altogether successful yet. So I have no idea if anyone's even listening to me. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, you're here. Oh, great. Um, this is, I'm just going to give a link. Okay, it is, um, it looks like 15 are watching. Wow, that's a success. <laughs> it looks like 15 are watching, which is good. Um, definitely good. Okay, good. That's it. Um, oh, and uh, Sophie, thank you that you um, had to reload the page. So um, definitely follow her lead. Um, and I'm just typing that back to her, your lead. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Um, we tested it out this morning. And to be honest with you, it worked fine seemingly. Uh, but of course, the one moment when it's supposed to be um, working, working, it did not work. Okay. Um, it's almost 20. Oh, yeah. Oh my God. That's fun. This is fun. Okay, so um, one thing that I'm really glad about this is because I know that I really announced when this was going to be last minute because I was really nervous to do this. And that probably seems a little strange to you guys as I post my chapters for the stories right after they are done and wait eagerly to hear your comments. But there's this level with uh, technology where I don't want to be seen as a dumbass, not being able to make it work. And everything from like the podcasts to everything that's on the site, I have Jeremy who helps me with all of that and Kat makes sure like the podcasts like happen and sound good. So um, we're just going to, since, since people are just getting in pretty much, oh, the broadcast keeps getting interrupted. Uh, yikes. Okay, well, I'm not sure how to fix it. Nah. Stream health. I'm, I'll am check that. Uh, okay. Yeah, it doesn't really say... Hmm. Hmm. So I hope that... Uh, it's interesting. It should be... It should look different. It should look different, but it doesn't look different, and I do not know why. And weirdly, I'm only able to see your comments if I'm actually previewing the page, which is fascinating. Okay. So, 
I think what we're going to do is um, at least I'm going to try to do the chapter. Okay. I'm going to try to do the chapter, um, which is going to be chapter three of Empire of Stars. So forgive me while I just take a little drink here. Good. I'm glad it's working fine for many of you. Sound really good. To, okay, good. That That's good. That's excellent. I want, you know what, I'm going to do chapter three of Empire of Stars. And um, if you guys want more, let me know if you have questions about anything, you know, ask, you know, definitely ask in the comments. Because um, I'm really ex sort of excited to talk to you. I wish I could hear you guys, you know, um, but we'll see how this works. So this is going to be chapter three. And by the way, in Empire of Stars, we are going all action all the time and some really funny stuff coming up and some really scary stuff coming up. So um, can we get chapter five? I wish we could get chapter five, Sophie. I wish I'd written chapter five yet. I have not written chapter five yet. I'm actually working on Vampire's Club uh, book seven because I am behind on that. I thought I was going to be really excited. Um, I thought I was going to be really productive during this pandemic. And in fact, I've been less productive and very annoyed at myself. So I wish I could give you chapter five, but it's going to be so good. I'm telling you right now and scary and funny and interesting. And well, anyway, I'm over promising. Hopefully I will not under deliver, but um, I'm really excited about that. Okay. We're also going to like, um, Kat just told me she's going to send out um, the link again to everybody um, just in case, because uh, we might, you know, get more people in because of the nonsense with Facebook. Um, I've not read one and two yet, been waiting for a few chapters. Yeah, I hear you, Lisa. That makes sense to me that you're waiting for a little bit more because right now the Jace chapters and Jace, as you guys know, is, you know, our equivalent, like the person that we're stepping into the shoes with, from, um, his chapters have been really fun and it's been sort of like, what's going on here? And the Koth chapters have been more setting up the universe and the rules and everything that's been going on um, and sort of getting an idea of some of the species out there and some of the overarching stakes. So I know those haven't been, I don't want to say they haven't been as interesting, but I think that they are much more dense and far less action packed. Um, okay, uh, here we go. Smart move. Uh, I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she's, you know, Janelle is right with you, Lisa. But I'm going to tell you the next three chapters that are being posted in a row it is going to be basically um, all action. We're going to get our, our two main characters together, and I hope it's going to be a really good time. Let's see. So um, we have a question here from Kelsey. Oh, that's so sweet, Kelsey. She says, hello, it's an honor to hear you. When is your next vampire manga going to start again? Thank you. Yeah, I have to have I have to um, say I'm sorry about that. Um, I'm having Mathia do this really cool thing. You guys are going to see it in the next couple months. Um, and then we're going to have her get back to working on uh, that manga. So don't worry. There's two more mangas, two more volumes in um, uh, the Data Vampire. Um Mangas don't sell worth a damn, but you know what? I don't care. I, I mean, yes, you know, uh, in terms, the Dark Earth has sold and it sells, but the, I actually pay the artists like top dollar for these things. And I think that shows in the art. It's more to give you guys something and to see my stories in a different, uh, a different way. So um, that's, that's, but that's going to happen. But she's doing something that's so cool for Ever Dark Academy. I cannot wait for you guys to see. Okay, so Alec asks, Will we get renders of spacecraft locations and alien races or early alien races? Or do I have to commission more fan art? Alec, I always want you to commission more fan art. And I have something so brilliant that he commissioned that I'm going to share with all of you guys. It's so beautiful. I mean, Alec, if you can share it, do that as well, but I'm going to put it on the site. So it'll be a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, but yes, we are doing more. I, you know, I wish there was, I could clone Mathia anyway. Oh God, we're losing, um, 
we're losing stuff here. Okay, so yes, so that's coming. I'd, so Marina says, I'd love to hear chapter two, how do I pronounce all the things? Uh, watch me, I can't seem to speak English today, so I'm afraid how I'm gonna do with the alien languages. Um, so we'll definitely do that. And uh, Lisa says, are you shipping to the UK for the cups and things? Yes, we now are. It looks like they're doing pretty much worldwide. I can't speak for how much they're gonna charge you though, but yes, they we are. Uh, Janelle says, will you be keeping the four updates a month for Empire of Stars? Yes, and I'm doing this because I'm keeping it open to everybody to read because of the pandemic. I know a lot of people have lost their jobs. A lot of people don't have money. And I really want to, you know, do my tiny, tiny, tiny little part. And Marina says, the art is godly. I make sure to buy every manga. Oh, you are adorable. Thank you. It really is. I mean, T-Wolf and Mathia are just, I, they floor me with their abilities. Uh, Lisa adds as well, the art is amazing. Yes, it is. Um, I can honestly tell you that the art is what has made um, anyone give Wraith Rain a chance. That makes us actually look like professional, you know, God knows. And then Megan says, I plan on buying every manga because I love the art. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but like I said, I, I really believe that we need to support artists. Um, and we need to pay people what they're worth. Now, I know that I, you know, Mathia and T Wolf are worth even more than I can pay them, but I definitely know that it's helped both of them. Your contributions seriously have helped both of them, you know, meet, meet some of the dreams that they've had. Um, and I'm going to talk to them and, and ask them if I can't share some of the stuff that they've been able to do because of the steady 10 years of employment with Wraith Rain. So I'll, I'll talk to them about that. Oh, okay. So Lisa says, don't mind. Oh, thank you. Thank you for not minding that. I know a lot of people because, you know, um, we can't all buy everything we want and art especially means so much to people. And they just want to, you know, they want to look at it and have it and hold it, but they can't afford everything. So sometimes they just feel like, why are you charging me for this? You love doing it. But it's like, no, you have to, if you pay the artist, as you guys all know, I'm speaking to the choir here, they're able to do more than you want. Oh, Sophie, yes. Oh, I didn't know you were shipping internationally now. Going to check the store. So yes, we are. They are doing it. Um, we had some bizarre experiences getting stuff to Canada. Um, it took a long time and um, there was some weird stuff, but yes, they are doing it. So check and see. I just didn't want to really announce it, announce it until we're going to, we were going to have some test stuff, but try. Um, that's definitely a good thing. Okay. So um, I think we are going to um, try. Yeah. I see that. Um, an email came through so on my email account so i'm assuming that it went out to the rest of you and i hope that that's true we're gonna you know what um i'm like really excited to try uh well i guess you know should uh, here's a question guys um should i read like one through four or should i just well that's gonna take a while so should i just read one two three or four or more than one of them, like Jace's two chapters? What do you guys think? Because I'm tempted to read one and three at least. Oh, while well, waiting for that, um, Jennifer asks, any plans to release Elven King's Blade as a physical books? I'm elf obsessed and a big fan of your work. Pleased to hear about the international merch shipping too. No, I'm not planning on making any of the serials into uh, books or eBooks. Um, the reasons are manifold. First of all, I um, there are, if you guys have ever, let's put it this way, it would take a lot of editing and it would be a lot of books. And um, it, it just is not something that I think, uh, to be honest with you, yes, it would make money. Yes, it would do all of this and all of this. But I think it takes away from the specialness also of the serial site. I think that if people, you know, because I really get so much out of the serial site, and I think you guys do too. It sounds like people want me to start from one. <laughs> um, but just to answer that question, no, I'm not doing any of the serials in either ebook form or paperback form. Now, I never say never, but that would take a lot of work, and I'm just... Uh, 
work that I don't know that I necessarily, um, that will add to our enjoyment, but maybe we'll, I don't know. Let, let me think on it, but I don't think so. I, I think that's not what I'm going to do, but let me think so. All right. But you are all here to hear Empire of Stars. You are not here to listen to me babble. So I am going to go and start from Empire of Stars one. So when I'm reading, I won't be able to see your comments. I'll try to switch over to take a little break. Yeah. Three is so good. Marina three is so good. And actually when you get to five, you're going to, it's, that's going to blow three out of the water. Um, and then, oh, I have so many plans, so many plans. All right. All right. Here, let me get, let me get back to one. So just, I'm going to do it now. Okay. Chapter one, Gehenna. Jace Parker gazed down at earth from the pilot seat of his Paladin class spaceship, the Storm Spike. Other words, alien words, with sibilant syllables echoed in his mind. These other words were those of the ship's creators, the Altaith, or as they were also called, the Precursors, which described the true class and name of the vessel, words very different than his own and almost impossible for human vocal cords to reproduce. The ship's artificial intelligence, or AI, whispered these exotic words to him, reminding him that though the storm spike felt like it had been created for him alone, humans had not built this vessel or created any of its technology. It was almost as if the AI wanted him to remember the al Taith and honor them, even as it accepted its new name and pilot without other complaint. But not even the universal translator could turn the ancient alien tongue into English or any of the other hundreds of thousands of known languages. The al Taith were long dead, or perhaps, as some thought, they had simply stepped away from this part of the universe and had left their cities, ships, and other technology behind like scattered children's toys and a playroom rug for others to find. But they had also left their enemy here, an enemy that only their technology could defeat, but few remained could use that technology to its fullest extent. All appears quiet, Gehenna, Jace said to the ship's AI. Yes, though that could change at any moment, Jace. The cool have been too quiet as of late, Gehenna reminded him patiently, and that means they've been planning something bigger than usual. You don't think they've given up? He lifted his right eyebrow, even as a smile tugged at his lips. The cool will never give up. It is not in their nature, she replied simply. The AI had chosen a female voice similar to his mother's, but a slight bit wryer in tone. He thought the choice a good one. His mother, Colonel Diane Parker, was head of the military air base known simply as Area 67, which was a top secret military installation tasked with the development and testing of experimental aircraft for the U.S. military. Colonel Parker was not only highly respected, but beloved by those who served under her, which included his father, Captain Jack Parker, an experimental test pilot. So by choosing his mother's voice for her own, the AI was cast in his mother's reflected light. Yet the AI had also taken the name Gehenna, which was in rabbinic literature known as a place for the wicked, or in more generic terms, it was another name for hell. The juxtaposition was strange to say the least, but Gehenna, for all their closeness, remained a bit of a mystery to him, maybe more than just a bit. She was opaque in many ways, which just intrigued Jace more. After all, she must know what happened to the al -Taith. She must know what their words meant, at least in comparison to his own. Yet she did not translate them for him or for anyone. She professed an ignorance that he didn't quite believe. You almost sound eager for a fight, Jace grinned. I grow uneasy when the cool are absent for too long, she answered grow uneasy? That sounds almost, I don't know, almost suspicious, Gehenna, he teased her. Are you going all mystic on me? I thought you were all facts and figures. Only as mystic as you wish me to be, Jace. 
After all, I have aligned my communication style to one that suits you best, she stated dryly, such as your insistence that we speak out loud rather than simply mind to mind. Only because it's hard to tell where I end and where you begin when we do that, he confessed. But that is the point. We are to be one so that all systems perform optimally, she reminded him, and there was that slight chastising tone his mother had always used so well against him when he hadn't done his best at something, choosing to be lazy instead. But it wasn't laziness that was holding him back now. It was the desire to remain himself. He sensed that if he ever truly gave himself over to Gehenna or any of the AIs that populated the precursor technology, he would change in ways that he wouldn't like. You must know that these fears are foundless, don't you? Gehenna, of course, knew his real reasoning for everything. Her tone was gentle now. You were made for this. If you changed at all from it, it would only be to become what you were always meant to be. Jace turned the topic of conversation, knowing that this was not an argument he wished to have right at that moment. Earth looks beautiful tonight. Yes, it always does, she agreed, and he believed she felt that herself as she had found Earth and determined to protect it. They were on the night side of Earth, and the lights of civilization stretched across the whole of the continent of North and South America below him. They reminded him of brilliant starbursts, that were connected by glowing arteries of light. Though the lights were unnatural, they signaled that the planet was alive. They announced to all who saw them that there were beings below who thought, lived, dreamed, and died. It was like that moment in the movie Contact when Jodie Foster's character stopped in her journey through various wormholes only to see an alien world awash in light and realize that there was intelligent life there. He remembered the electric feeling he had experienced during that scene. To know that there were other beings out there was, to him, a religious experience. Humanity was not alone. Humanity was part of a greater whole. And it had a greater purpose, too. Hold on one second. I'm just going to check the stream because I want to make sure everybody's okay. And then I'll continue on. Okay, it looks like you do, uh, guys are doing okay. Um, I'm hoping, I think Kat's reviewing uh, what's happening too, so um, she'll alert me if there's a real big problem. All right, so back to the chapter. Oh, wait, drink, and then back to the chapter. He thought of all the people down on the planet never dreaming that above them were thousands of spaceships protecting them from what lurked in the vast darkness of space where Earth spun. Uh, yes, Kat is watching. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I got distracted by her. Okay. Um, people like he had once been, but now the kid who hadn't been able to get his driver's license due to crippling migraines, seeing auras, and the near-constant tinnitus was a protector of Earth. And the disabilities that held him back were what made him special. I am sorry for that pain, Jace, Gehenna suddenly said. But it was because you were not where you were supposed to be, doing what you were supposed to do. You are a pilot, and this determination to still hold yourself back is just as unnatural. I'm more than a pilot, Gehenna. I'm more than just my ability to in interact with precursor tech, he told her. He stretched out his right hand towards the orange-colored holographic controls that appeared between him and the screen, oh, and the screen where Earth was projected. The wrist of his thin skin glove was not fully sealed. He tugged on the light material until it merged with the sleeve seamlessly. Even with the glove on, he could still feel everything as if his hand was bare. The thin skin would, though it would protect him in the vacuum of space or any number of temperature or atmospheric conditions. It also could change color with his mood, which sometimes amused him when he made the whole suit a fiery red, though mostly he kept it a shimmery gray with highlights of neon green. It was then when he looked up between his spread fingers that he saw the warning light. 
orange had turned to an alarming red as the storm spike systems identified a threat. On the edge of his ship's sensors, enemy vessels had been detected. The screen in front of him shifted from showing the peacefulness of Earth to the ships that were streaking towards it. They were long and needle-shaped, cool vessels filled with drones ready to drop down onto any planet and assimilate the population into itself, food, or even fuel. The process was just as horrible and destructive no matter what the end result. And this time, they were here to assimilate Earth and humanity. The bitter taste of adrenaline and fear flooded Jace's mouth as he dropped his hands to the controls. Gehenna, he said, alert the others. The swarm is here. And just as he was, and just as he was about to turn the ship's thrusters on, there was the blare of an alarm, shrill, piercing, deafening. Gehenna, what the hell is that noise? He demanded, shut it off, I can't concentrate. In fact, the whole spaceship was becoming opaque, hazy and strangely unreal. He put his hands up to his ears, trying to drown out the squawk, but it did nothing. I'm afraid I cannot, Jace. It is not coming from my systems, but yours, Gehenna said almost sadly. Mine? What do you mean? But then Jace jolted awake in his, jolted awake in his bedroom. His phone's alarm was going off, an annoyingly blare of raw sound. He flew upright in bed and sat there, unsure where he was for long moments. His heart beat wildly in his chest. He blinked his eyes rapidly as he tried to square this ordinary bedroom, desk chair covered in this week's clothes that weren't dirty enough for the hamper, desk piled high with his notebooks where he sketched and wrote, windows covered with shades that showed morning light around the edges, half-closed closet doors with shoes spilling out, and the clean, almost antiseptic yet cozy space of the storm spike. We're not in Kansas anymore, Toto, he thought mirthlessly. He managed to hit the stop button on his phone, and the alarm went silent. It was 7 a.m. On, on a Monday morning in Sunrise, Arizona, population 300. But if one added the military personnel onto that, it rose to 3,000. Allegedly 3,000. Unlike on many bases, where military personnel lived both on and off base and used its local city services at Area 67, some unknown amount of people arrived on base, but never left it. They were working on such secret projects that they, <laughs> they were working on such secret projects that they had to work, sleep, and eat on base. Jace didn't bother asking his parents if the rumors were true or what kind of projects would acquire such dedication. They would never answer him and betray the country they both served and loved so much. But still, Jace wondered. He rubbed his face with both hands, still feeling slightly foggy. Whenever he had these dreams, when he woke up, he felt like he'd left part of himself behind. He'd been having these dreams for years, but only in the past six months had he decided to turn them into a novel, or maybe even a series of novels. His unconscious mind must have liked that idea because the dreams were coming to him more often and with greater detail. He blindly reached for the notebook and pen on his nightstand. He had to write down everything he remembered before wakefulness washed it away. He certainly didn't want to forget that the ship's AI was named Hell for all intents and purposes. It amused him no end. He wondered why his unconscious had mind had decided on that. Was it because the AI would later be shown to be a villain? Maybe the true assimilation would come not from the cool, but from the precursor technology that would mind meld with every human it could and turn them into pilots and not people. But he didn't like that idea. It felt wrong to him. He was sure that in the story he was writing, the AI was trustworthy and his ally. He had learned to trust his gut instincts about what the story needed. As he scribbled down the details in the notebook, he thought he would have to maybe change the AI's name so people didn't get the wrong idea not even as a red herring, but that, oddly, felt wrong too, as if the name Gehenna was right and had to stay. Jace frowned at his unconscious mind's stubbornness about this. Just because he dreamed something, it didn't mean that the story had to be the exact copy. Yet his fingers slowed as he tried to write down alternative names for the AI. None appeared. His forehead furrowed, and he felt the beginning throb of a migraine behind his eyes. He quickly smoothed out his forehead, and the pain retreated. A little, but not much. 
No, 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 not today, he pleaded. I promised Walter I would man the store all day today so he could go to his granddaughter's birthday party. I'm not taking that away from him. Jay set the notebook down on his cluttered nightstand, knocking over a few books, including a pile of the Expanse series. He grimaced as they fell to the floor and wedged between the wall and the nightstand. Getting down on the ground and fishing them out would likely just increase the pressure in his head that was already growing. He had to do everything he could to keep the migraine at bay, so the books would remain there. He carefully got up and padded over to his desk. His medicine was in the right pants pocket of the jeans he wore yesterday. He fished out the orange bottle and unscrewed the white top before popping a large gray pill in his mouth and dry swallowing it. The medication didn't have a name. It also didn't come from the pharmacy, but was formulated by a group of doctors on base for him. The reason why was that nothing else worked, and the reason for that was they think it was something I was exposed to on base when I was pregnant with you. His mother had told him years ago, her head downcast, her eyes not meeting his. He had almost been glad she couldn't see his eyes. He hated the guilt in him. It should be her eyes. Oops. <laughs> I make find a little mistake there. He hated the guilt in them. It was unwarranted. She loved him and would die for him. There was no way she would have knowingly done something that would have harmed him. It was a terrible accident, and that was that. He jammed the bottle back into his jeans pocket. He'd be wearing these today anyways. Best to keep the pills right there in case he needed another one later. Besides, these pants were his favorites. They were soft and worn in all the right places with a bunch of patches he'd sewn on when the tears had gone from cool to a little bit too revealing. He grabbed them in a faded lime green t-shirt off the back of the chair. He sniffed the t-shirt. It didn't smell of sweat or laundry detergent. His migraines could be triggered by anything really, but strong smells were thought to be a factor that he honestly couldn't say was true. Or rather, there were only certain scents that would trigger him. But they weren't the faint floral or ocean breeze smells that were found in laundry detergent. It was often the, sm the smell of ozone that did it. One whiff of that electric bitter scent and his vision would flash black as if the matrix were failing and he was seeing the real world for a moment. But instead, his vision would come back and his head would merely throb. Auras would swirl around objects and the high-pitched ringing, ringing of tinnitus would be in his ears. He'd avoid that scent like the plague today. Okay, taking a minute break to take a uh, drink and check the, the stream. I hope you guys are enjoying this. I'm making less mistakes than I thought, which is sort of good. Um, this is like good. Okay, everyone seems to be pretty all right. This is, yeah, nice, nice, nice. Um, okay, let's see, I will go back now. A pair of clean boxer briefs and white socks completed what he needed to get dressed. He would get ready in the bathroom after a shower. He went to his closed bedroom door and paused. His gaze swung back to the black Ray-Ban sunglasses sitting on the edge of his desk. Wearing them inside would be a dead giveaway to his parents that he was already suffering from a migraine and they would insist he stay home. He might be 24 years old, but they still worried about his fragile health. He gritted his teeth just thinking about it. If we didn't blame his mother for his conditions, he hated that he was so brittle. Daily living was a stretch for him most times. He wasn't sure how he was ever going to get a job that could support him. Forget about his dreams of being a pilot like his father, let alone a spaceship pilot in my real dreams. He was lucky that Walter was willing to give him some, ship, some shifts at this combo book movie convenience store. But Walter was getting up there in years, and even businesses in Sunrise, Arizona, were feeling the Amazon pinch. So how long would Walter remain open? And who else would tolerate Jason's significant absenteeism and other requirements like dim lights? He doubted anyone, and a flare of panic filled him like it often did these days when he thought of the future. But he pushed it down. Maybe the doctors at the base would find some tweak to the medicine that would fix him. Maybe he would be able to parlay his story into something that could make money. Yeah, right. Do I think it's gonna self I'm gonna self publish my book and become Richard Castle overnight? He shook his head, which was as much a mistake as furrowing his brow at the pain of the migraine, as the pain of the migraine seemed to slosh around in his skull. 
He stopped the movement and held himself very still before picking up the sunglasses and firmly putting them on. He was glad he had because the moment he opened the bedroom door, the bright, clear light of an Arizona morning blinded him as the big windows at the end of the hall didn't have their shades drawn down as they normally did. Keeping his head down, he dashed halfway down the hall and zipped into the bathroom. He heard his parents talking together at the end of the hall where the kitchen was. Neither of them had seen the sunglasses. He sagged against the back of the bathroom door for a moment. He caught sight of himself out of the corner of his eye in the bathroom mirror. He turned his head and nearly laughed out loud. His dark brown hair was sticking up in every direction from sleep. His gray eyes were hidden by the sunglasses, but his thick, expressive eyebrows lifted in amusement. He had a strong jaw and high cheekbones. His olive-toned skin looked even darker due to the sunglasses. He was reminded of Tom Cruise in Risky Business when the actor had danced in his underwear and sunglasses. He was in nearly the same outfit. Not quite as cool, though. That caused a grin to light his face. The grinning hurt, too. He sighed and let his face relax. The medicine will kick in soon. It will be okay. You'll be fine. He forced himself to get ready. With only this frosted small window in the bathroom for light, he was able to take off the sunglasses to brush his teeth, shave, and shower before quickly dressing. He again toyed with the idea of not putting the sunglasses on when he exited the bathroom. His headache was a dull throb at the base of his skull now. The tinnitus, too, was just a low ringing in his ears. If he was careful, things might remain this way, manageable. He slid the sunglasses on and popped his head out of the bathroom. The shades of the window in the kitchen and eating nook were now closed. They had realized he was awake. They're forced to live in darkness because of me, he thought bitterly. But he was grateful for the lack of light. He took the sunglasses off and hooked one arm over the neck of his t-shirt. He then strode down the hallway to grab some food before taking off to work on his bike. His mother was seated at the three-person wood table. She was in her dress blues, a dark blue skirt and blazer with a crisp white shirt and tie. There was a cup of coffee in front of her and the remnants of toast. His father was in the kitchen, leaning against the counter in his green flight suit with his booted feet crossed at the ankles. They both stopped their conversations to greet him. You're up early, his mother said. Walter's granddaughter is having her 10th birthday. He agreed to have it at his place, so I, uh, I told him I'd work the whole day, he explained as he splashed some of the coffee from the pot into his dark blue to-go cup. His parents were quiet at this for far too long. Jace gritted his teeth. Wait for it. Just wait for it. His mother's voice was strenuously neutral as she asked, Is he going to let you close early? What? Uh, no, why? Jace grimaced when he asked the last. His father's handsome, square-jawed face smiled at him. Because that's 16 hours a day, champ. And I can hardly handle half that. That's what he's thinking. Jace kept his own voice easy as he shrugged and said, Should be slow today, with the base on alert about those Naruto runners. The run to get past security is one today, isn't it? They're going to find all those spaceships you're hiding. His mother gave out a laugh that was laced with annoyance. Ha <laughs> ha, it's so ridiculous. Hardly anyone showed up at Area 51, and those who did attempt anything were caught right away. Nothing more will happen here, considering we're not half as known for having alien technology. His mother put air quotes around alien. Chase wished his parents were working with alien tech, but no, it was all human-made. He would be the first one out there otherwise. Area 67 may have less people who know about it, but they're more passionate, his father stated mildly, and took another sip of coffee. So I wouldn't discount what they might try. A flicker of worry crossed his mother's face. She tucked a loose brown curl behind her ear. It had slipped out of her bun already. I just want to ensure that no one gets hurt. The people who come here are mostly harmless. She stood up and grabbed her cap. Do you want, a ride? Do you want us to give you a ride to work? Jace had just put some toast into the toaster. He shook his head. <clears throat> I'm going to ride. Besides, you guys need to get on base. His mother hesitated, and he felt his parents give each other worried looks. Jace pretended he didn't see as he grabbed butter and grape jelly from, um, it should be peanut butter. I love it. Oh no, butter and grape jelly from the fridge. Okay, 
Well, if you need anything, you'll call, right? His mother's voice was artificially bright. He replied in kind, sure, absolutely. How about never? I won't ruin Walter's day or my parents. His mother headed out of the house while his father lingered behind, rinsing out his coffee cup. Wait for it, Chase thought again. He almost smiled as he anticipated what his, what his father was going to do. The light hand on his right shoulder was the start. Jace, I know that you'd rather gnaw off your own arm before you admit you don't feel well. And by don't feel well, I mean you're in agony, his father said. I'm fine, Dad, really. I mean, I'm just going to be sitting behind the counter. I'd just be sitting here otherwise, Jace told him as he concentrated on buttering his toast. It was easier to lie if he wasn't looking into his father's gray eyes. His father squeezed his shoulder. I know you say that, Chase, but you dead. Jace accidentally slammed the knife on the counter. It clinked loudly. The sound had his tinnitus flaring. He drew in a deep breath. He modulated his voice as he said, If I can't sit behind a counter, then what can I do? His father was silent for a long moment, but then firmly stated, There are lots of things. No! Dad, there aren't. You know there aren't. Jace's hands fisted on the counter. He was shaking. His vision started to blur as a stress built up in his neck and shoulders. It's going to be okay. Your mother and I have plans in place that will make sure you'll be taken care of no matter what, his father said quietly. You don't have to worry. That I'll never be able to live or work like a normal person? That when you guys die, that there's plenty of life insurance? Jace's voice was strained. The thought of his parents dying was beyond hideous. It should be. Oh, yeah. I, I You know, I, I love finding little mistakes here that I did not see before. Um, the thought of his parents dying was beyond hideous. But he also knew that he should be grateful for what his father was saying, what his parents were able to do. So many others weren't so fortunate. Yet he shook his head, the headache sloshing around inside like acid, and continued on. Is, are people still able to do the uh, stream? Yeah, it seems like it's still going. Okay, so Cat like dropped off, but it seems to be okay. Okay, sorry about that. Cat just sent me that she'd had an issue. If anyone else is having an issue, please let me know in the comments. Um, Cat will be hopefully able to look at those um, as I go back to start to continue reading the rest of chapter one. And then we should talk about chapter one, give my voice a little bit of a rest. Okay, I don't see, it still says it's showing it's live. Still seems okay. Still seems okay. All right, back we go. You can't possibly understand. You're a goddamn fighter pilot. You're a, a hero. You and mom serve our country, save countless people, and do important work. I can't even work a cash register for too long before I need to lay down in a dark room with no noise. Heat flooded his face, and he felt his headache pounding like a drum. This was bad. Getting upset just made things ten times worse. He tried to breathe, but his chest was so tight now, too. He really hated himself right then and there. He knew feeling sorry for himself would do nothing good. It certainly wouldn't change anything. And taking it out on his father, who was just trying to help, was wrong. But he couldn't help it. I know that things seem hopeless right now, Jace, but... Because they are. But I'm still going to go to work the whole day today so that Walter can have a good time with his granddaughter. That means I've done something good, Jace stated as he slipped out from under his father's hand. He went back to his bedroom and slammed the door shut behind him. He sat on his bed in the dark, head in his hands. He waited until he heard the front door open and close and the sound of his parents' car leaving the driveway of their stucco ranch home. He stayed there for another 10 minutes, left leg bobbing up and down, feeling guilty and sorry for himself. I'll call dad later and apologize. I can make that right at least. He stood up, grabbed his notebook and made his way back outside the bedroom. He was running late, so he crammed the toast in his mouth and took a slug of coffee before he headed outside. This time, he didn't hesitate to put on his sunglasses. The heat took his breath away. 
even this early in the day, it was already in the 90s Fahrenheit. It would be over 100 that afternoon, cooling in the evening, but still not dropping below the 70s. Walter's shop wasn't that far away, but still he'd be sweat drenched when he got there. After slipping his journal into the bike saddlebags and the coffee into the holder, he swung his leg over the bike and took off. It was a mountain bike and cruised over the hot asphalt smoothly. He was squinting behind his sunglasses, and there were auras around cars, but he didn't care. The hot air was running through his hair. The drive chain was singing. He wasn't going all that fast, but there was a freedom to it, and he needed that right now. He zigzagged through the streets until he came to Walter's shop called the Convy, which was a cute name for saying convenience. No one, though, ever got it. Walter came out the moment Jace rounded the corner. He was in his late 70s with wispy white hair that barely covered a spotted scalp. He had lean legs and arms, but a pot belly that hung over a belt that had a large eagle-shaped belt buckle. Walter shaded his watery blue eyes from the already bright, burning sun. He waved as Jace glided over to him and pumped in the brakes. He dismounted. Hey, Walter, I'm sorry I'm late, Jace said, slightly breathless. Sweat ran along his spine and down his temples, but he felt refreshed. You're fine, Jace. I, I'm just eager to get back and start decorating. The expectations of ten-year-olds are higher than you might think, Walter said with a deep belly laugh. Jace grinned, even though his head hurt from the movement. I bet. I want to make sure... I want to make it perfect for Jenny, you see, since her dad passed away last year. Walter's usually rubbery smile died for a moment. Well, I just want her to have a good time. She will. She definitely will. Jace felt so damn glad he was doing this. It gave him strength to ignore the pain he felt. He touched Walter's forearm gently. You go on and start the preparations. I've got this. Are you sure, Jace? I'm asking an awful lot of you. Walter's face was creased with concern. Jace kept his face, smile firmly in place as he said with certainty, Absolutely, I'm good. Don't you worry about anything. Walter looked relieved and immediately brightened. Well, I'll be back around closing time tonight. If you need anything, call and I'll be right over. I'm just a block away. Don't worry, Walter. I know, but I'm not going to need you. Jace assured the older man. Well, I do appreciate it. Lunch and dinner is on me. You order whatever you want from Lulu's, Walter said, naming the diner down the block which had the best food. Sounds great. I... Jace broke off his sun off suddenly as a cloud covered the sun. The hair on the back of his neck stood on end. His headache pounded so hard he felt it in his bones. The tinnitus whined like a hornet. He turned his head to look up at the cloud. It was more than a cloud. It was a bank of dark clouds boiling along the horizon. He thought he saw lightning in them. Whoa, where did that come from? Walter asked as he stared at the clouds, too. For a moment, Jace thought he saw something long and needle-like threading through those clouds, but it disappeared. But Jace knew what it looked like. It looked like one of the cool spaceships that he had dreamed about. But, of course, that must be impossible because that was a dream. There were no cool. There was no storm strike or Gehenna. Aliens, if they did exist, we're not flying spaceships above Sunrise, Arizona. Okay, so that's the end of chapter one. Um, I am like so excited. I, I, that was fun to do. I, I hope you guys liked it. Um, I hope I didn't massacre it too much as I'm doing it um, straight off the page. Yes, 10-year-olds are so demanding. I had, when my nieces were that age, though, they were so sweet, I have to admit. But they, they were really weird kids. Like, they were, like, awesome versus how normally I was. So do you, what do you guys think of Chapter 1? Like, um, is there anything you want to ask me about Chapter 1? I need to, like, rest my voice a little bit here so I can't go immediately into Chapter 3 or anything like that. Um... I think what I might do, um, if it's okay with you guys, well, okay, we can do either, I think I can do one more chapter before my voice goes. So my question to you is, do you want me to do chapter two or chapter three? I hope this thing is still working. I never know if anyone's here. No, it, it's just live. Okay, hopefully everything's good again and I'm not talking to myself 
<laughs> Witches. Possible. It's so possible. Oh, thank you, Lisa. Okay, so you did hear. Okay, good. So people did hear it. I cat unfortunately was kicked off, so she couldn't tell me if anything was wrong. Um. Love it from chapter one. Yeah. Okay. You want me to keep? If you guys want, well, it's up to you. If you want, you know, chapter two today, or if you want um, chapter three today. Thank you, Sophie. I, that does make me feel better. I just, I'm not, um, I'm just so not savvy with it yet. I hope, uh, <laughs> thank you, Marina. I'm not talking to myself. <laughs> it's happened. Um, so, you know, what we can, I, I can, um, if people are really like interested and I know there's just us, okay, vote chapter two. I think chapter three. Oh gosh, you guys, you're making me. We need a few more votes. Chapter two or chapter three next. I can do chapter two. I mean, I can do them all at some point. We can, um, like, do this next week. Um, it's surprisingly hard to do this, like to talk, talk long for me, which I, I normally I, I chat I ch I'm a chatterbox, but this is a little bit harder. It's it like even votes for chapters two and three. All right, no, 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 two. They're both so good. Okay. Um, well, you know what? I, you know what? I will, I'll do chapter two so that it's easier for people who are listening to these later. And if you guys want to listen, because it's posted on the actual um, site, it's going to be not site, but it's going to be posted on FB so you can listen to it later. I'll do um, Jennifer Koth is in two. So I, I will actually do chapter two next so that it's easier to do in sequence. Um, and then I will do um, more next week. I could do two more chapters next week for you guys if you wanted me to do that. Um, oh, Marina, the reason why is it's because it's um, a lot of alien words and I want to make sure it's fun. Yeah, Sophie, you got it. We're going to see if I uh, do it. The reason why I I seem like I don't want to read three is because I I mean two is because I love three. Yeah, I'm gonna do it next week, Janelle. I'm gonna I am gonna do it next week. So I'm going to I think I am gonna do two and then so people can listen to these in order and it'll be just better. So then I then I will do maybe three and four next week if you guys are interested in doing this again. Um I think it's just fun. It's just a fun time. And if anyone has any questions um, I will try to go back and uh, and look to see. It, it, Facebook does this thing where it sort of scrolls the comments, so I, I miss some comments. There's like 82 comments supposedly here, and I'm like, holy cow, that's awesome. There's, I'm glad, like, um, a nice little 25 of us listening, so this is, this is fun. This is something that I don't have to be scared about doing. All right, so I'm going to start um, two. Uh, I'm going to do two now. I'm going to take, like... I'm going to read a bunch of it and then I'm going to take a break to take a sip of um, <clears throat> Diet Coke and check the stream uh, to make sure everything's okay. All right, so here we go again. All right, opening chapter here. You know, it's funny, I went back through these to see, you know, typos and like weirdness and I still miss stuff even after going through chapter one like 50,000 times. So that just shows you right there. Okay. Chapter two, the rule. Commander Kothfor, you are accused of violating the rule of Dukeshka by risking your command, 24 highly skilled pilots, to save one. High Counselor Nova Vor pronounced from her seat at the council table, known as the Vak, 20 feet above Koth's head. Her voice was even. Some would even characterize it as cold. There was no familiarity in it. No one would ever know she was his mother from the way she spoke to him. What say you? Koth's fingers curled slightly towards his palms. It was the only sign of emotion he showed. He quickly forced them straight. 
His voice was as even and cool as hers as he answered, It was necessary. I did not ask if it was necessary, Commander Koth. I asked if you violated the rule, she stated crisply. The six counselors to either side of her nodded their heads in agreement. They loomed above him in judgment now, but not one of them had been in a battle for over ten cycles, some much more than that. His fingers twitched. He stilled them again. He lifted his head slowly so that he was looking directly at his mother's face, blanking out the rest of the counselors speaking only to her. She had commanded more missions than all combined up there. She had to hear him. She had to understand. The rules were there to guide, but they should not, could not, become a prison that would stop a commander from doing what was necessary. Hear me, mother, he willed, even as his face showed none of his need. She veiled his vision, blue skin like the color of the Lakach flowers that grew in abundance on their homeworld of Hassian. The whole right side of her face was tattooed with the Tana, her marks of victory in battle. Her back had grown too full to contain them all. She was given a dispensation to mark those great battles on her face for all to see. He had been granted the same, but for only one battle with the cool. He wondered if he'd be commanded to remove it after this. He felt he deserved to lose it. I could not save Desa. I could only end her suffering. We lost the best of us with her. I believe that the rule does not apply in the situation I was in, he answered, not allowing any of his raw feelings to taint his voice. As it was a mission to save our high commander, the concern of, stay, of sacrificing the many for the one was not triggered. You expect us to believe that you acted as you did because it was your high commander in danger and not your sister. His mother lifted a white eyebrow, her glowing blue eyes, a deeper blue than her skin, darkened. And your daughter, his traitor's mind whispered. A tremor went through him, but he stilled it and shook his head. He would have been gutted to lose Desa, but he would not have risked 24 other pilots just to save her. They might be blood. He had loved her and would always love her, but the rule of Dukeshka was at the very core of Thafel society, the many above the one. It was something that every Thafel was taught from birth to death. The needs of the society were greater than the needs of the individual. To act to the detriment of the whole for the benefit of the one was verboten and punishable by exile, the worst of all punishments. Better to die than be split from the whole. But there were exceptions, and risking himself and his command to save Desa had been one of them. Saving her was saving all of the Illumin Alliance. That she is my sister played no role in my decision. Koth said with chin lifted, meeting every set of glowing blue eyes on that vac. Let them see the truth in me, he continued. High Commander de Savor was worth more than 25 lives. She was invaluable. He included his own life in that, 24 under his command, plus his own equal 25. I would give my life and so many others to have her back, Koth thought and grief threatened to eclipse his a powerful control. High Commander de Sa was a fine pilot and a keen strategist, his mother stated. Her voice remained as even as ever. It did not catch over saying her daughter's name. But she was one person. One person. He remembered every second of the mission where his sister's saber-class ship, the Alarian, had been overrun by the cool, and she had been taken. The Ilarian had responded to a sighting of a, a squadron of cool ships by a mining operation on the planet Draciela's surface. The mining operation was small, and it was only a sighting of the cool. There had been no attack. The cool could have simply been passing through. It hardly warranted attention, let alone attention by the Ilarian and himself. But his sister had thought very differently. After they had done a sweep of the system without success, she had contacted him. He remembered her face on the view screen. 
She was not seated in the command chair of the Illyrian. Instead, she had been in her quarters on the war vessel, where he and his command were all in their paladin-class fighters about to dock and head back. Her expression was rarely relaxed, with the tensity it normally carried was increased. She was the leader of the Illumin Alliance's military branch. It was assumed that she would be their mother's natural successor as High Counselor when Nova was ready to sound. Responsibility for everyone had been drilled into a sister every moment of every day of her life. But the usual weight on her shoulders had been doubled. But why? They had found nothing. I am about to find out. Koth, she said, using his first name without his rank. That and the fact that she was speaking to him in a private channel from her quarters without any of her first officers meant that she wished to speak to him outside of their roles in the military. Still, he answered automatically with, What can I assist you with, hi? She waved a hand through the air, cutting off his words. This is your sister speaking, not your superior. I need you to hear me, Koth. He paused for a moment, then added, What is it? What do you sense? We have searched the quadrant and found no sign of the cool, she told him, her expression growing grimmer. She was telling him what he already knew, but he understood that she was listing the reasons for why, logically, she should not do whatever it was that she was thinking of. She tossed her head and the selshitli, the beads in her hair that showed their family's station, clacked together almost angrily. But I feel that there is something more here, Koth. I can almost smell the cool in this place. He continued to be silent. His sister only confided these feelings to him. In the past, she had shared them with their parents, but that had stopped. Both Nova and Thadden Bohr had been clear that following instincts was for lesser species, not for the Thafel. Let the Nakuk, or the stars forbid, the humans follow their gut, as it was said. But the Thafel followed logic and left emotion and superstition out of it. Yet her instincts had been proven right more time than anyone's logic ever had been. It was part of her gift as a strategist. What should we do? If the cool are here, we must find them. This may be the edge of Alliance space, but it is still our territory, he stated. She nodded, her eyes distant, as she contemplated something inside of herself instead of outside of it. Finally, she shook herself again. The cell chalite clacked some more. I want you to go down to the surface and speak face to face with those who called us here, she instructed. Chikshak was the name of the Zoles I spoke to. He was sweating like a narlac in heat. Zoles always sweat, he pointed out with a twitch of his lips. She smiled back. Not that much. He was practically in a puddle of it. Koth lifted an eyebrow. <laughs> Koth lifted an eyebrow. Are you sure he was simply not intimidated by speaking to you, Desa? He likely did not expect to reach the High Commander when he alerted the Alliance to a cool pod. I do not think so. In fact, she tapped her lower lip as her eyes grew distant again. I think he wasn't surprised to see me at all. Koth's frown. Perhaps he did not recognize you then. A smile played on her lips for a moment. Well, then he would not have been intimidated by me if he did not recognize me. Now could he? Koth shrugged. I suppose... So what do you think the reason was for his nervousness? I think he was lying about something. I know he was lying, she insisted. I just need to know about what. And I trust you, little brother, to find out what that is. I'm surprised you do not wish to pursue this yourself. You have a greater sense of other species' emotions than I do. She smiled again. This time it was a fond smile. On the contrary, you are very sensitive, Koth. He let out a huff. <laughs> By the stars forbid. It isn't a bad thing, no matter what mother what, what uh, no matter what mother and father say, she told him softly. They are caught in the old ways of thinking. They are pure Thafel, he protested, thinking that nothing could be so good as that. If just Thafel thinking could could defeat the cool, we would have done so already, she said and passed a hand over her forehead. He was too shocked to say anything at first. Then he managed Perhaps we should ask the Oda, the Grillix, or the humans for their thoughts about defeating the cool. He had meant his words to inflame her. The species he listed were hardly evolved. 
they had the most basic connections to the Altaif, not like the Thafel, whose connection was deep and wide. But his sister did not rise to the bait. In fact, she looked sadly at him, as if he had disappointed her in his answer. Maybe we should, she said. This time he was truly struck, struck dumb. She drew in a deep breath and released it, centering herself before continuing. Will you go down to the surface and find out what the Zoles was lying about? She could have commanded him to do so, but she would not. Not about something like this that seemed like a fool's errand. He nodded. Of course I will do this, he stated. The weight on her seemed to lift a little, and he was proud to have taken even a little of the burden off her. Report to me alone when you get back, she stated, and began making the motion to sever the connection. Desa, he called out before he could think better of it. She paused her movement and lifted an eyebrow. He had intended to ask her if she had spoken of these ideas to anyone but him. He had intended to ask her if coordinating with the lesser species was part of her plans. But all he said to her was, be careful. And you, little brother. And then she was gone. I need a little break to take a drink. Just checking also the stream. Nice. 34. I'm still, it still says 25 in mine. I think it's gone up. I don't know. We have about 2,000 members. <laughs> so it's, it might just be a small contingent. But I'm glad for anyone who showed up. I really thought it was going to just be me. <laughs> so this is good. I hope you're enjoying um, chapter two. Uh, Marina, yeah, his, his back. It's going to be really cool when we look at that. He's got a lot of them. He's done a lot in his short years. Okay. So, yes. So, and yes, uh, Tara, three is so action-packed. And Olivia, you are correct. Three and four next week. Um, we will meet other alien species, Sophie. In fact, they are going to be part of the group of misfit toys, uh, that's going to be part of, um, basically the group that, that, um, Jace is part of and that, um, our dear commander gets put, um, in charge of. So he's going to have his hands full with all the people that he thinks are lesser. So he's going to find out soon enough. That's not true. Mm. Laura, thank you so much. I appreciate that you love chapters. I'm having such a blast writing this, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I had watched, uh, I had played rather, uh, Mass Effect, the latest one, and I was so disappointed. Um, you know, sometimes you cannot recapture the magic, but they just did not put all the love and stuff behind it that they should have. So I feel like I, I've always wanted to... Um, do a story with this kind of all groupings, all different kinds of species together, saving the world, the universe rather. Okay, back to chapter two. Um, Commander Koth, his mother's voice was sharp. His head jerked up. He lost himself for a moment. What had they asked him? Ah, the many above the one. Well, it might be politically expedient to tell the masses that we are all equal. But she, High Commander Desa, created our plans, both offensive and defensive against the cool. She was more successful than any other High Commander, Koth stated. She was better than even you, Mother. You know this as well as anyone. His mother was rigid, and her blue eyes flashed as she said, The rule of Dukushka is not something we just say. I am not speaking about the value of anyone. No one is intrinsically more valuable than another, Koth stated feeling he had nearly just stepped into a trap. And none is more valuable than the whole, his mother added. Yes, so you know that if the cool obtained the information that Desa had, then our best plans against them would be theirs. Koth shouted as, as his control cracked. For a moment, his mind offered him the image of Desa, already in one of the pools, body softening, already infested. Her eyes were focused on him, he saw one of the larvae move underneath her right cheek, a black oblong shape that slithered as it separated, softening flesh from softening bone. Nausea and horror bubbled within him. And by taking your entire command with you into that cool ship, you could have given them 25, 25 more of us, his mother said softly. No one taken by the cool has ever come back uninfected. The moment they are taken, they are injected. There is no coming back, Koth. 
He swallowed and answered, I know, but we could stop them from knowing what she did. I did not make it an order to accompany me to rescue her. There was a vote. A vote? Counselor Ardath Ulgax, his mother's second, scoffed. She did not hide her disdain, her handsome yet sharp features narrowing with dislike for him. When she held the role, while she held the role of second, she wanted to be first. You are a commander of the Thafel. Any under you who would not follow your lead are not fit to fight. Koth shook his head. The Selishite in his hair clacked together, and Dace's face in that final agonizing moment was before him again. Despite the agony in the eyes, there was a clarity, too. There had been a pleading. Do it, Koth. End this suffering. Don't let them take what I know. Koth got out. This was a choice. I made it clear. If it was a choice, Counselor Essek Bilkars, the oldest on the council, interrupted softly. He, had, he was known for his calm nature, but Koth knew that Essex's voice might rarely rise in volume, but his words could be most cutting. Then shouldn't your whole command be here to be punished as well for violating the rule, Commander Koth? Koth had expected this argument. He would never allow his people to be punished for his decision. Even if I agree with you that the rule applied, only a commander is responsible for his actions of his command if he participates in the actions. Counselor Essex smiled almost sadly and nodded his head. Your loyalty and intelligence make the actions taken by you to violate the rule that much more painful to hear, Commander Koth. No one, his gaze slid to Counselor Ardath for a moment, finds this tribunal easy. Indeed, I for one believe that you acted in what you believed were the best interests of the Alliance. While I am certain you felt great pain at Deza's loss, I do not believe that you that is what solely motivated you to break the rule. Koth found himself holding his breath. He had fully expected to lose his command, his Tana, and potentially be exiled for his actions. But I would still do it again. He just wanted to be understood. Counselor Essex seemed to do so. But did his mother? She was the one who would judge him ultimately. He searched her face. Her eyes met his, but then drifted to their to his father, Thadenvor, who stood behind Koth. His mother was High Counselor, in many ways she stood alone, but his father had always been her touchstone. His father had urged his mother to recuse herself from this tribunal. Koth had hidden and watched them decide part of his fate. You think that my emotions will cloud my judgment? She had asked his father as she had placed the length of their communal room in their home. I am saying that it does not matter. Whatever you do, whatever punishment you give, it will never be thought neutral, his father said patiently. Explain, his father patiently explained as he stood still in the very center of the circular space. Punish Koth too harshly, and there will be those who say that you were doing so not for his bad judgment, but for grief over our daughter's loss. Punish him too lightly, and they will think that you are protecting him. My punishment will neither be too hard or too light. She stopped pacing. Her, she crossed her arms at the wrist behind her back and stood stiffly, almost as to attention, even though she had been his father's commander when they had met. I do not doubt that, but others will always believe that no matter what punishment you give, that it is wrong, his father had answered her smoothly. That is why you must recuse yourself, so that Koth is not only justly judged, but there, that there is no perception that he wasn't. His mother had gone silent, but then she lifted her chin and said, You know I cannot, because to recuse myself is to show weakness. It is to say I care more about what others think than my own judgment. I will lose face, and we will lose control of the council. His father had sighed, and Koth had wondered if his father believed they already had due to Koth's actions. <clears throat> Sorry, I need a drink. Now here they were, with his mother about to pronounce judgment upon him. Counselor Essek, his mother stated, without looking at the man to her left, your words are wise as always. You see Commander Koth's motivations quite clearly. Counselor Ardath let out a sharp laugh. Found a way to pardon your boy, High Counselor Nova. I just want you to understand, Mother, that I did not do this to dishonor you or Deysa or the Illumin Alliance. 
I did this to save us, Ha thought. His mother, though, ignored Counselor Ardath's sneering comment and continued on as if nothing had been said. But, Koth tensed, but. But you still broke the rule. She lifted a hand, anticipating that he was about to speak. For a good reason, and maybe you had to break it. Koth blinked. Did she understand? Could she forgive him? She continued, but, but. He leaned forward. It felt like every cell of his being was waiting for her judgment. Everything you've said is true, Commander Koth. If the cool managed to assimilate her, they would have known things that would have crippled us, his mother said. They would have been able to anticipate our every move, and we would have been scrambling, back-footed, and in great danger. His eyes flickered over his face. She understood. She knew he had not betrayed the Alliance. He had not broken the rules simply out of grief or love or any of those trifling emotions. You did this thing for us all she said with a nod, but then she met his gaze. Which is why you will not be exiled. Koth let out a breath, even as Counselor Ardath hissed coldly. But there is no question. My son. She paused then, and he froze. There is no question that you broke our most sacred rule, and there must be consequences. For if there are not, others might do the same for reasons as good and not as good as yours. If one infected gets back to the Illumin's worlds, it would be disastrous. He knew that. Before the rule had been instituted, people had brought their loved ones home and had hidden it from the authorities. Whole worlds had been lost this way. But after the rule, the, sp the spread had stopped. Your punishment, therefore, is to to go to Earth, she stated. He stared at her. He couldn't quite believe what she was saying and what he was hearing. Earth? Earth? That is the name of the human homeworld. That cannot be, Koth stated. There are no cool anywhere near Earth, not since that single ship malfunctioned and crashed there. No, there are not, his mother agreed. There will be nothing for me to do there, he stated. I will have no purpose. I will not be able to avenge Desa. I will not be able to defend the Alliance. His mother's gaze was steadily on him. You will go to Earth. You will serve the humans. And there you shall remain. For how long? he asked. Until we call for you, she answered, her voice dipping for once during this whole exchange. And what those words really meant was that he would never come back. Earth was worse than exile. Okay, that's the end of chapter two, guys. Are you drinking Diet Pepper, Laura? Oh, I'm a Diet Coke fiend. I love it. I love it. I love it. I, I drink Diet Coke like an idiot. I mean, really, I should, you know, oh my God. Oh, and Marina about the, the the beautiful hair bead things. I I was like making that up on the fly, but it seems like that does work with the the words. I use a um na some name generators to help me with some of this stuff. Um, hopefully I'll remember how they're pronounced next time when we're doing it. And I realize I have to just fix this chapter a little bit because we learn a lot more about the last time that the cool was on Earth, and it wasn't in, you know um in chapter four. So. That's really important, as you guys probably already know. Um, so does anyone have any questions? Uh, anything you want to talk about? You're most welcome, Sophie. I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to do it again next week. I'm going to try to do it like um, a weekly thing and see where we're at. A weekly or a bi-weekly thing. Um... It was a lot of fun to do. Oh, Amanda, I am so excited about three, two, but I'm really excited about five with my ideas for what's going to happen. Oh, Hannah, thank you. I hope I just didn't like destroy your name there. I really appreciate it. I, I really, I used to, I think a lot of people know this, but, um, I used to tell stories to people and I used to act them all out. So this is like, 
like that and I, I miss it. Like in high school, I would tell romance stories to my girl and guy friends. Um, yes, so so that's how you're gonna, yeah, that's how I get those names. I really use the name generators a lot um, because they have an internal logic that mine don't always. Although sometimes things just come to me, like Gehenna's name, I don't know why. Um, yes, canned. I will definitely do as a weekly treat, you know, treat, and then um, people get these obviously um, afterwards, however they want to do them. Um, I'm hoping that it will give some idea to them uh, if we could put, I could put a note or something in so people know what it is. Yeah, Olivia, definitely. This will be really good. Um, and Melissa asks, when will Koth and Jace meet? They are going to meet probably in chapter six. Um, we're we're going to have, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely chapter six. Lurleen, I'm so glad you did. Thank you. That's so sweet of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So they'll meet in chapter six, I think. Um, chapter five will be Jace going, I think I'm going to have him go save that birthday party. Um, but there's going to be a lot of cool, cool stuff that happens. And then in chapter six, we see um, a space battle with uh, Koth and his people, and then he goes down to Earth. So, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes, 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 yes. And the heroes are going to get on together a lot. Um, yes, Gehenna is like the abyss, but less, less ruthless. I don't know if she's yeah, she's sort of less, less ruthless. This story is sort of like a combination of, you know, as you know, like Mass Effect and Star Trek and really also aliens. Um, so Sophie says, um, you mentioned in chapter four that the coolest use the gates. Can they use the gates to go to Earth or the Alliance? They can. They can. I wonder if the Colossus ship is full of the Kenazai's ships in the unopened. Oh, it, yeah. I mean, that ship has to be there somewhere. Will there be fireworks? Um, there will actually, there will be something I'm thinking of calling Iron Rain. Because um, uh, basically, Jay's is able to do something that just, like he's able to do lots of things people can't do, but what he does there is going to be pretty awesome. Even in his beginning. So yes, but there'll be fireworks between them because it, he will upend everything that um, they've, they thought they know about humans. So, and, and it will be Jace getting to honestly see an alien for the first time. And, and then I take, take that back. He's seen the cool, but you know, there's not the aliens that you want. So, <laughs> So yeah, so yes, like remember Jace is just like he always wants that first contact. Yeah. Laurel asks, what of Koth's team? Um, actually Koth is going to be put in charge of a ragtag group of people of all different races. Um, they will not he's gonna be the only Thafel on there because they basically um you know he's still being punished i mean they can't they can't reward him yet at the same time his action like jace is so important that um it, it's definitely going to be uh you know it, he's it's going to give him either his time to shine or his time to go down you know down the chute basically and we know he's going to shine because jace is there laser blast laura laser blast I, I, I think that's how that, you know, laser beams or laser blasts something. Yes, it definitely will be that way. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think this, this is going to be like huge and sprawling because I think of how long it's going to take just for them to meet and then just for them to hook up with Gehenna and then just then, oh God. And then it's going to be like, you know, the odd couple company and... I have a scene where I have like Jace drinking alien alcohol and how that goes down. Um, and he plans a rave. <laughs> so I have some real fun ideas ahead. Is Jace like an experiment? And that's why his parents take care of him so much. He is not an experiment, not the human experiment. Nobody, no, they don't really know what's wrong with him. Uh, Olivia asks, uh, Koth being so restrained, he reminds me of Spock. Yes, I based him on Spock. I actually based them on the 2009 um, movie version of Spock because I absolutely love um, that. Tara asks, are they going to believe Jace is really hearing the AIs and acknowledge they actually exist? Um, yes, not at first, but yes, they're going to pretty soon because of something that's going to happen. Um, Koth is, Sophie says, Koth is Spock, but much more sexy. Yes, he is. 
more sexy. They have a more sensual side. I think really I should tell you it's the 2009 version of Spock and all the fan fiction of Spock out there. I always love the fan fiction where Spock was sort of honestly a kink, man. He was like, he was really into, um, I don't want to say controlling Kirk. I love those stories. Yes, he is more than a fighter than Spock. He is. I mean, Spock is much more um, a science officer versus Koth is definitely a warrior type. He's definitely a front lines kind of guy. And he's going to be running after Jace constantly. I think so. There, there we, that's going to be fun. Based on, okay, so Sarah says, based on reading the last chapter, was Stargate one of your inspirations? And oddly, no, although I love that show. Um, and I think that um, it, it, it really has a lot of things that probably will show up in this just because it's sort of like these ideas are really shared around in a lot of these uh, stories that appeal to me. But you no, know, um, Stargate was not one of my inspirations. I And Sophie says, I also love this fix with Spock because Zeno, that I don't know what Zeno is. I'm, I'm, if you could tell us more, Sophie, that would be good. I might just be being stupid here. Um, so what I will do is I will, I'm not going to update the, I'm not going to have Jeremy update the calendar, but what I will do is I will again, be sending out emails this week, um, to everyone to know that when the next session is going to be, and, uh, therefore you guys can listen to it. And again, I, my understanding is, um, this thing will actually, um, save and upload. Oh, wait, Dominique has asked. How many ideas for the story do you already have? Since I know, ah, wait, wait, wait. Since I know you wanted to do it, or have, have you coming up and thinking of things as chapters go? I always have, I, I have a ton of ideas, but the truth is that the characters really lead me. And sometimes those ideas don't come to fruition and others uh, totally do. And I mean, and I think that um, I listen to the characters. Oh my God, Sophie, alien sexuality. Yes. Of course, I see what you're saying. Yes, we're going to have a bit of that for sure. I love that. And that's going to be in this. I think it has to be in this because that's what makes it really interesting and fun. Because not only is he blue, but he's awesome. Um, Olivia says, Koth was straight to anger in being exiled to Earth. So his meeting Jace made me wonder what he's going to think of how emotional Jace is. Oh, it's going to be something where Koth, um, you know, sometimes when you're confronted by somebody who is so much more emotional than you, you can be very calm and sometimes they just drive you bananas um he's going to be both of those things sophie says i want to know how koth is different than humans down there surely there are some small differences there will be and honestly if you guys have any suggestions i want to know them because i think we can have a lot of fun with this especially there's going to be um tara awesome thank you for stopping by I, you know, and I go back to this idea that, you know, let me know because honestly, um, I, there's this scene in my head and it, it, where basically, you know, Jace like talks to people who know about what that look like and ask them what the differences are having sex with them. So I want to know what you guys think. Uh, Lurleen says the gate reminds me more of Thor's homeworld. Asgard, in a way, that's, that's a really good way of thinking about it. Um, that is a very good way of thinking about it, but it's only for ships rather than just people stepping in. Um, and there's no rainbow, but you know, there is the, the so, um, awesome. Okay. Um, I think I will, um, stop for today. My voice is like shredded. But again, I will be emailing you guys, letting you know when we're going to do the next one. I'm at Saturday. Um, yeah, Sophie, I think a poll on the kind of genitalia would be a great idea. I love genitalia polls. Stormy, thank you so much. I can't wait. Um, I hope you do come back. I know that things are really hard for a lot of people. And um, Wraith Rain is not like rent or food. But that's why we're keeping this story open. And we're doing as much as we can. 
Um, yes, Sophie, I definitely could find inspiration and fix with Spock for this one. I try not to look to other people's fanfic. Um, <laughs> Olivia Feelers. Ooh, Dominique, you're welcome. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad this made my day too. This, this was, this has been a lot of fun. This is really a lot of we will, I'll put up some kind of blog post about Koth's anatomy, and you guys can tell me about the kinky, you know, things you want to do, you want to see in this story. That's that's the best because I'm sure you'll find you'll have something better than what I could think of. I'm absolutely sure of it. I'm positive of it. That's always the way. All right, guys, I'm going to um, end the video now, but um, we'll talk again soon. And. Uh, I really thank you so much for showing up and listening to the to the story. So all right, you guys take care. Talk to you soon. Bye.